So today I'm going to be talking about the real time and swag. Uh, uh, I'm from a company called uh, Fujitsu. We do Node.js hosting. Uh, we also host uh, databases like CouchDB uh, and RedisDB. Uh, so if you are running Node.js in production or are planning to run it in production, feel free to host it at us. Um, uh, I'm also starting a company together with my uh, partner here uh, called Observit, and we're doing a user monitoring in real time, hence my affiliation with real time. Um, so we're basically tracking all interactions and clicks and mouse movements of your users and allow you to generate some analytic reports based on that and basically figure out what users are actually doing on your website. Um, you can reach me on Twitter or Word Eden or in GitHub with a dash in Eden. Um, so what uh, does it mean to have swag? What does swag stand for? Um, we all know the normal swag, but in this case we're going to be talking about uh, Socket.io, which is a real-time framework um, created about three years ago. Um, it supports a lot of different ways to establish a real-time connection with your server. It supports uh, long polling, um, web sockets, uh, JSON polling, and uh, iStream streaming. Basically all the techniques that we're used to uh, or used to be doing in the free HTML5 world. Um, in addition to that, it always uh, supports web sockets. Um, the S is also from SockJS, which is another library, uh, which had similar goals to Socket.io, but um, it supports more transports. Um, it supports uh, event uh, source or service and events through iframes, um, more um, polling trans uh, transporters and stuff like that. But I'll dig uh, deeper in that in a bit. Um, the W is from WebSocket because it's one of the best transports, or is it? Uh, we'll see that in a minute. Um, then we have Engine.io, which is the new backend of Socket.io. Um, it's a really low level. Um, it does something completely different than they used to do. Uh, with Engineo, they start with polling and go up to WebSockets uh, just to figure out if everything is still compatible, everything is still working. So it's a bit more stable than the older versions of Socket.io. And then we have the G from Google Browser Channel, which not a lot of people have heard of, but it's actually a really cool technology and it's actually powering Gmail as we speak. And it's also completely open source because it's part of the Google Closure library. Um, so why do you need swag instead of maybe just WebSockets? Um, because WebSocket all the things, it's the latest technology, it's awesome, it's almost everywhere implemented. Um, if we look at the browser support, we got um, Chrome 20 uh, with the latest RFCs or the latest specification that it supports. Um, but if you want to have a more broader support uh, for your browsers, uh, you can support um, older specifications and then you can have support back to Chrome 4. Um, it is a bit harder to implement, um, it has more maintenance overhead, but if you want to go the extra mile, it's definitely possible to get a broader support for WebSockets. Uh, when we look at Chrome, uh, I mean Firefox, we get Firefox 12, where they started implementing the RFC. Um, all the versions, so those are prefix with uh, the MOS prefix, uh, and also support uh, an older specification. So again, broad, broad support, but not there yet. Um, we got Opera, an older version of Opera, but forget about it, nobody's using Opera. <laughs> <laughs> Over 11 also has support for WebSockets, but it was behind a copyright flag, so none of your regular users would be using it anyway, so this is basically useless. So we're going to move on. We got uh, Safari 6, which supports the latest version of WebSockets. Uh, if you want earlier versions, again, uh, you get support to Safari 4, which is decent support. I don't know how much of the older version for browsers you need support. But for some people, this might be enough. For others, it might not be enough. Because you always have IE 10. <laughs> there are probably users here, or developers here, that have users that use IE 6, 7, 8, or even 9. So you might want to have 
support for them, but finally I can have some decent WebSocket support and I will have now as well if they don't break it. You know. uh, but there are problems with WebSockets and uh, not a lot of these problems are known to people. We always just assume that we have to type in our, in our um, script just new WebSocket and everything will just magically work. But this is not the case. Uh, there are some bugs in all the implementations of browsers uh, which can cause a full browser crash and one of these uh, crashes are caused by proxy settings on your Mac. Um, it's randomly enabled on certain Macs and if you have this flag enabled and open a WebSocket connection your whole browser will crash. Yeah. That's not a pleasant experience for your users. Um, but there are more and different issues like writing to a closed WebSocket can also cause a full crash. So if you don't maintain state or check state, um, it will just completely crash. This is fixed in some older versions of Firefox, but it's not ideal, especially not known around the web. Um, another one is pressing escape <laughs> in Firefox. Um, I don't know who all implements games or even a model dialogue and we all want to just get rid of it when we press escape and the website connection is gone. It's because uh, it just cancels all network, re network requests that are still outgoing. Normally it would only do that uh, until the page is loaded but Firefox has this really wonky bug where it also does this um, after the page has been completely loaded. Um, you can just fix it by adding an uh, event listener for key up, check the event code, and just return a uh, well, prevent default of the event. Again, it's something you need to know, and not a lot of people are aware of it. So, another really cool issue is Firefox can create ghost connections, and these are really hard to debug. Um, and the problem with this is these connections will persist even if you close the tab. So you have completely destroyed Firefox um, in order to close these connections and there's no way of tracking where they are and it's still an active issue as we speak. So the best way to go around this is to not connect during uh, a close event, so just add a small delay to it. But it's all fun. And then we always have these great mobile devices that we carry all with us all the time and they switch networks, they are behind uh, proxies of our providers and these proxies they can uh, block WebSocket connections because they are not up to date yet with latest specifications they don't understand the WebSocket protocol yeah, it's awesome <laughs> uh, but it's not just your network providers, it can also be a firewall who wants to monitor your network and everything that comes in to your uh, browser. They might pre-filter all the WebSocket connections and just um, stop your connection just because they can, because you installed it. You want to be safe on the web. And WebSockets are not safe according to them. But it's not just fire, fire, uh, fire scanners, it's also the, the server firewalls or even the firewalls that you've installed on your computer itself. Um, these all need to be enabled to support WebSockets. So if you're using ancient technologies, you might be having problems with WebSockets or maybe your users will be uh, having these issues, especially uh, uh, enterprise users. And then as always the service side part, we have this massive infrastructure that we need to support and what we always do is slap some load balances in front of it, this will be the load, but if you're using Apache, um, 2.2, it doesn't support WebSockets, it's only added in 2.4. Uh, if you're using out of date versions of Nginx, it doesn't support it. Or maybe you just didn't configure your load balancer correctly. Uh, but these are just really real issues. These are things that you can solve. But most of these issues with WebSockets are things that are happening on your user's environment and are out of your control. Um, so, yeah, using new WebSocket doesn't look that simple anymore if you have to take into account all these issues in order to establish a really rock solid working connection. Uh, this is usually the reason why uh, people go to different uh, different uh, frameworks, but then again WebSockets does have its advantages. 
because it's uh, bi-directional and full duplex. It only establishes one TCP connection and it can stream a lot of data over a really small connection and um, save bandwidth uh, as well. Um, in addition to that, it, it can send binary data. So if you want to transfer images back and forth, it's all possible with WebSockets. Um, and it's also great if you really don't give a fuck about your all the users and all the browsers. Just keep your technology simple and just use WebSockets with all these hacks applied. Uh, so the main use case for using WebSockets would be um, really uh, latency intensive uh, gaming. Uh, these are games that usually cannot uh, have a real, proper real-time interaction with uh, your users if you have a really high latency. Uh, so, the, <laughs> yeah, then we have calling, that's the only option that we usually have because we still need to get all the data from the server and get data back to the server. Uh, so, you might think, yes, we're going to implement polling, it's easy, we just do a set them out and create new, um, new AJAX requests on the fly, but there are always implications like you might need to be connecting in a cross domain fashion. Um, and in all the versions of IE, you don't have uh, cross-origin support. So you need to also implement JSON polling. And when you implement JSON polling, you get all these really annoying loading indicators and progress bars at the top of your browser. And this is really confusing for users because they think everything is loading, I have to wait, I can't interact with the site yet, it's not ready yet. Um, there are fixes for this, but I'm willing to bet that not a lot of you knew that you can actually fix these spinners by adding an iframe and removing it again directly after. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one hack for Firefox, but there are more like these little, little changes that by uh, interaction with your site. Um, another thing that a lot of users or implementers don't care about is the back forward cache of your browser or even cache in general. When you go to a, a different page and go back again, browsers think they are smart enough to uh, cache the connection and reuse it again, but that doesn't work for real time. Um, and this could cause uh, loss of connection or no connection at all. Uh, a way around this is adding a random timestamps to each URL. But again, it's something you need to know. Uh, most frameworks, of course, have already implemented this, so it might be a better or, or a smarter idea. And then there's always the use case of uh, implementing heartbeats because you need to remain some state on your server in order to know is this connection actually closing or are we in a polling cycle. So in order to know if your connection is still alive, you need to have the client send small packages to the server from, hey, I'm still alive, I'm still waiting for data. And the server also needs to know, hey, this client is still alive and we are still capable of sending data. So heartbeats are uh, a fundamental uh, piece of technology when you're implementing real time. Uh, but the problem with this is, is that you're sending uh, another piece of data over the wire and you need to have some protocol invention in order to know that this is a heartbeat and this is messages and this is all adding another layer of work on top of your simple polling system because you don't want to use web sockets. So, um, frameworks, these are usually the best option if you don't want to waste your time or unless you're feeling adventurous, of course. But most people prefer using frameworks. And, um, if we're looking at Socket.io, which is a, a really popular framework for Node.js, but they also have implementations in Python, Ruby, uh, even PHP, or uh, think even uh, .NET. Uh, there are some really good points about Socket.io. It supports multiple uh, transports, so you can just use JSON polling, XHR polling, streaming iframes. The framework will take care of everything. Uh, but what not a lot of people know is that Socket.io 0.9 was infested with bugs. Basically all versions prior to this were also infected by bugs. I know it's because I was one of the core uh, <laughs> maintainers of Socket.io until uh, 0.1 got released. Um, so it, yeah, it was poorly maintained, it was basically left for dead by um, the rest of the maintainers. Uh, issues were stacking up, pull requests were not accepted. 
basically all kind of indicators that you shouldn't be using this project. Um, another thing that most people don't know is that you sometimes need to have a um, guarantee that your messages are right in order. Um, for example, if you're doing a uh, content editing uh, application and you send a delete message and an add message, you don't want that add message to arrive before your delete message. <coughs> it's, it's these simple things, but um, it can be an issue for some people. And also it dies behind firewalls and fire scanners because it didn't know how to handle uh, WebSockets exceptions in these cases. Um, then we have some good use cases for Socket.io. I mean, if you want to have a real time in a cross domain fashion or have the requirement of multiple transports, it's definitely a good um, trans or, or framework uh, to be using at the back end. It's also great for sending uh, moderate amounts of data. It's not really uh, at the high end of streaming a lot of data with low latency, but it's decent enough to build some applications for it. But if you're building applications for it, don't make it user consumer, consumer facing uh, because they will just have all these issues. I mean, internally, you probably won't care because you're probably using up to date browsers, but it's not something you want to bother your users with. Um, and then we have Engine.io and Socket.io, the one, which is basically the same. The only difference is that Socket.io. Um, one is adding some syntax sugar on top of it, making it a bit easier to work with, adding JSON encoding, um, over it, support for rooms, joining rooms, um, and uh, middleware layers to it, to uh, interact with all the data, intercepting data. Um, it supports multiple transports, but less than Soft.io used to support. It doesn't have any support for streaming iframes anymore, or streaming XHR requests. They all just nuked it from the source code, um, same as uh, a flash fallback with what Socket.io used to have. They also removed it uh, recently. Um, the biggest change here uh, was that they changed from upgrading uh, or downgrading to upgrading. So they start with JSON polling because we know that it's one of the most stable transports uh, for real time. So they don't have to do any feature detection. You can just connect and start sending data. Um, but the problem is you have this upgrading process which will take a, a bit of time and you don't have the most optimal latency um, and there's a small bug which causes a lot of data during upgrading but let's just ignore that for now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to know. Um, and it works really behind firewalls and fire scanners because it just uh, remains the last known working uh, transport while it's upgrading to WebSockets, so if it fails, you don't have any loss of connection. But it's really not well better tested yet, or they wouldn't have loss of data during upgrade. Um, there are apps built with it, but it's not there yet. It needs more testing, it needs more users, it needs a lot of polish. Um, again, no message order guarantee. Uh, this might be a requirement for application if you're doing a document editing. So there are some great advantages to using uh, Socket.io.1 or Engine.io directly. Um, it has quick connections, as I said. It doesn't care uh, much about latency, uh, or at least you don't have to care much about latency in order to use this. Um, it's cross browser, and it also supports uh, binary data for the latest browsers. And if your browser doesn't support it, they will just base for your system, page 46 and code. Um, all your data, so you have uh, still some decent amount of uh, binary support. And then we have uh, Google's browser channel. It supports multiple transports, uh, mostly polling transports, uh, basically only for polling transports. Um, it's not really cross-domain. <laughs> So I don't know. <laughs> uh, just forget about that it's cross domain. It doesn't use operating or downloading. <laughs> Ignore it. Uh, it has advantages. Be aware of that. Uh, so, <laughs> problems. Um, it doesn't do cross domain. Um, it has no WebSocket, so it only has following. Um, 
if you use it on node, it's built with CoffeeScript. There are some different versions for it, uh, for uh, Python, for Ruby, or even a standalone um, C server based on libq events. So it's really event that doesn't use any threads or really low latency. Um, but the problem is it's really not well documented. It's hidden somewhere in these code closure framework. Um, so if you're not an avid user of Google Closure, you will probably have never heard of this. Um, but it is uh, really good for sending some regular real-time updates. You don't have to be streaming a lot of data because it's still polling, so you will have a lot of latency, but it's still good enough for frequently updates. Um, it's cross-browser. Um, of course, it's completely battle tested by Google, so you know it's working as intended. Um, it's suitable for medium lift connection because it has polling, so it will have a lot of server overhead if you use it for long, long running connections. Um, and again, it has a lot of stability, and it has stability is here required over latency. So if you need to have rock solid connection and cross browser, but you don't have to use it in a cross domain fashion, so not sub domain, no different domain, no different domains where you're connecting from. This is definitely one of the best platforms uh, to go with. Uh, and then we have SockJS. It has tons of transports, literally 12 different transport types, flavors. Um, it's good, but it also has a lot of overhead, of course, because this client code has to be shipped to your browser, and not all your users will be using all 12 of these transports. Um, it's cross domain, but uh, while I was implementing SockGS, I noticed that it had a really poor uh, error handling. Even so poor that it doesn't even assign an error listener to a web service connection. Um, it's not ideal if you don't know what's happening with your connections. Um, it doesn't allow uh, query strings uh, to be used in the URL when you're connecting. So you can't send any um, starting data for authorization or uh, even just uh, a small fragment of data to the server, um, which could be required for authentication purposes. Um, it's poorly maintained. It's been unmaintained for the last few years. The last couple of months, a new maintainer arose and has been working on refactoring a lot of code. So I expect to have a new release of the SockJS client at the end of the year, but still, it's only one maintainer. It's not. Uh, big community of uh, people that are involved in this project. Um, and it's really in the way of developers. They have this idea that they must protect the developer against every sort of evil, and therefore they only allow four different headers to be uh, sent to the user. So if you have the idea of reading out cookies, uh, it's blocked. Sorry about that. Because cookies are evil. Everybody knows that. Especially the developers of SockJS. Um, but there are some advantages. It's great for um, sending uh, a lot of data using the most optimal transport. Because it has so many transports that it supports, um, it will always pick the most ideal of it. It's for the main cross browser. Um, it's great if you don't need binary support because it doesn't have any. Um, and it, it's capable for long uh, lift connections because it upgrades to web sockets. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is all nice, but there are always use cases where you need to switch between different transports, different libraries, because the requirements of your application are changing. Your um, supervisor might want to implement a new chat feature or stream uh, pictures from anywhere because it's fun and it's real time and users will love that. But, yeah. There's only one option, and in this case, it's a library that I've built. Uh, <laughs> so it's called Primus, and it's basically the YOLO for swag. Um, and what Primus, Primus does is uh, it's a wrapper around all these libraries. Um, so you have one common API, so you don't need to rewrite any code that you implement. In addition to that, it improves all these libraries. We have added error handling, proper error handling. To SubJS, we added uh, proper reconnect to the libraries because most of them um, went into a DDoS loop from your client side, 
and those are capable of sending thousand connections per second to your server because the reconnect was a bit wonky. Um, so yeah, we've taken all the experience that we've had with uh, working with these frameworks and both it all in one uh, big wrapping framework so you can basically just focus on building apps and don't have to worry about the real-time implementation that you're using anymore. Um, it's, it's a growing project. We've got a lot of team members now. We've got uh, five different maintainers. Basically everybody who sends two or more pull requests will automatically be added as owner to the project. <laughs> uh, just to make it easier to add uh, contributions to the project, work with the code. Uh, if something gets broken, we can always do a git revert and just run with it. Um, it's really up to date. Uh, our current release pattern has been a new version every two weeks. Uh, just flushing all the changes from the master branch to the user so you don't have to wait as long um, for your uh, for your fixes. In most of these frameworks, it can take up to three months in order just to get a release with your fixes. That's something that you don't want to have uh, with a real-time application because it's usually a critical component of your app. Um, it's really easy to use. Um, I don't know if there are any um, people who know Node or have ever used Node or NPM. It's basically a package manager uh, for modules uh, which you can install. Um, so Primus is completely written for Node.js at the moment. We are, uh, or we have intention of expanding to uh, different languages like Go and Python as well. Uh, as for the client code, we also have uh, people who've contributed a, a iOS library, so you are not dependent on uh, JavaScript only. You can still build mobile applications if you are using uh, PhoneGap, for example, but in most cases that's not ideal. You always want to have the native uh, performance uh, without the overhead. Um, so installation of uh, Primus requires two things. It requires uh, the library itself and the library that you are uh, wanting to use. Um, so you can install Socket.io, you can install Engine.io or WebSockets with the WS module in Node.js. Um, starting up a server is like 10 lines of code. You open your JavaScript file, you require um, the Primus um, library, you create a new server, and you tell it uh, which transformer you have to use. In this case, it's just WS or WebSockets or Engine.io, you can just change it, but it's, it assumes WebSockets by input as well. Um, and then all the thing, well, the only thing that you have to do is listen for a new incoming connection, and you can just write data to it, you can write um, JSON to it, you can write even binary to it, but I'll get back to that later. Um, and to receive information, you just have to listen to a data event, and your messages will be decoded automatically again. So if you're sending JSON from the client, will also receive JSON on the server. Um, for um, serving the client, we've automatically uh, added a URL that people could use, but we've also added uh, an option to the server side to just save the, the primus file to disk so you can host it on your CDN or even use it in your uh, build process, if that's the way how you will. Um, it's really a really simple API. You just you call a new Primus instance. You can listen to open events before you write data, but it doesn't really require that because it's smart enough to just queue all the messages that you write and wait until the open event to fire and flush all the data that you've been written and writing uh, again to Primus instance and just send it all to the server. And again, same method uh, for using uh, or for listening for data. As I said before, you can just easily switch between transforms using one line of code. The only thing that you have to change is transformer to engine.io, socket.io, save the library again, and that's it. Um, a really cool part of it is that it doesn't just support these uh, frameworks that I mentioned before. It also has the option to, to build your own, um, your own library. Uh, the reason for this is to basically remove any dependence on the Primus project itself. So if we're doing a sucky job of maintaining a certain 
uh, transport, you can just fork it, you can create your own and still use the same code base but using a different transformer. So this basically eliminates the whole need of our own uh, code base or ecosystem. Um, one of the things that um, note people while probably like is that uh, support and stream interface is really uh, a way in Node.js to send data from one point to the other point using one simple uh, API call. And in this case, it's, uh, it's the pipe method. So you can just uh, read a file from this and just stream it over your connection. Just be sure to not tell it that it has a connection because that will um, but yeah, it's a really cool way to just transport data back and forth between a client if you're using Node.js. Um, it supports all the, the methods that you might be using in streams and sports and for closing the connection and writing and for writing messages. Um, as I said before, we support automatic encoding of all the messages that you send. Uh, by default, this is um, JSON, but we also have support for eJSON, which is a support or a message format um, developed by the Meteor team to embed um, array buffers into JSON and provide a way to actually get your date instance back uh, from an object. Because if you JSON encode a date object, it will be transformed into a string. And if you receive it again on the server, you want to have a regular date instance. You don't want to work with a string because that's not the data that you've been sending. So it fixes all these really annoying things with JSON. But it's a really cool way of uh, just making everything a bit better. And the best thing about it is it just works on every transfer that you're using, even though the transformer that didn't support binary, because we're using this code to transform everything into a string, it will just work. Um, again, yeah, EJSA. And again, this also supports the same format for creating your own encoder and decoder. If you want to build your own message parser or maybe implement some way of um, compressing your JSON before you send it to the server by renaming keys and decoding keys again just to make the, uh, the, the packet that you're sending a bit smaller. It's all possible using uh, custom encoders and decoders. Um, one of the cool things that I'm the most excited about in Primus is that we support uh, message transformers. So you receive a message on the client and you can transform or rewrite the message to something completely different. But you can also completely intercept it. So if you want to uh, do a ping pong type of message pattern without your users or without your library being uh, notified by it, you can just return false and write uh, a pong message in the same uh, function call again and it will just completely remove this package uh, from the library and prevent it from being emitted as a data event. Uh, again, also for outgoing, you can just implement a decoder here as well, so you have different options, different ways of implementing these different patterns. It makes it, this code base really uh, flexible. Um, and one of the cool parts of uh, is that we spend a lot of time working on Reconnect. Um, Reconnect is something that most people simply forgot when they are building um, real-time applications, but especially on mobile devices when you're switching from Wi-Fi to 4G or switching back again, there is this period of loss of connection and if you're not restarting your connections again, your connection will just be dead. If you implement this incorrectly, and just do uh, reconnect again when you are online. You could potentially create uh, a DDoS attack on the server. Uh, when your server goes down, thousands of thousands of connections go down, and if all these users want to connect at the same moment again, uh, your server will just die under all this pressure. Um, so we've implemented uh, exponential back off, which is completely randomized. So this is all distributed during, during reconnect. So it hopefully will prevent your server from going down, but still. 
<laughs> so we have to be aware of that. Um, so uh, another thing that we've implemented is just broadcasting. It's, it's a common pattern in real time. You want to send a message to every connected user. You can just uh, call the, the right method on the server instance, or you simply iterate over all connected users and write a message based on various conditions. Gather the checks, put the checks, whatever. Uh, one other neat thing that we supported uh, was plugins. We wanted to keep the code base as light as possible. Uh, we don't want to do any maintenance or major maintenance on it. We don't want to have any opinionate, opinionated features built into the library, um, like groups or how you should be handling. Uh, multiplexing like uh, multiple connections using the same internal connection, uh, implementing rooms or even uh, other plugins uh, like a plugin for AngularJS yes. um, so you can just use primers with AngularJS yes using really tricky ways because I don't use it. Uh, <laughs> but still it's a really nice way of just extending uh, extending the framework and removing your dependence on the primary project itself. Uh, these are all built by the community. Um, really simple interface, just like um, the, the transporters or the transformers. Um, these all support uh, a server key where you implement the server logic, client, owner, and an optional library. Uh, and that's it. That's all that's needed to build a plugin uh, which can run on server and client. Um, another thing that we've implemented is uh, middleware. Um, these are basically uh, functions that are run before a connection is accepted uh, on the server. So you can uh, add some session data, parse out cookies, or even deny uh, connection before they even reach your uh, server. And there's one last um, way of manipulating your connections, and that is just to uh, uh, an extra argument to your connection uh, listener, which is... <laughs> which is a callback. Um, so we basically just check for each of these functions and check how many arguments uh, a function has. If it has one argument, we will just queue it for later. If it has two, we will um, call your function. We have an, an extra uh, callback function, uh, and we will block the emitting of the connection event until your uh, next function is called. If you supply it with an error argument, uh, it will just uh, close the connection for you. So it's just another way of adding a sort of plugging layer to your server. Um, and because you can basically have infinite use cases uh, using primers, you can switch between different transports for your different use cases. Uh, you can switch uh, message encoding. You can remove ad plugins as you want. Um, if people stop maintaining stuff, you are no longer in trouble. And that's it. Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah, you were talking in the beginning a lot about uh, web sockets and the disadvantages of using web, web sockets with all different kinds of browsers. But um, I was wondering about your opinion. If you're only doing a polling, how well suited would service and defense be? Um, service and defense really depends on your use case because it's only one direction of data stream. So you will only receive data from the server. Um, you can always just uh, add another polling layer uh, on top of it for sending data, but it's it's more optimal in most use cases uh, than web sockets because it's uh, a plain text protocol. So proxies will understand it and will not block it. They will just sniff the content like the NSA. <laughs> but it, it, it's it's suitable in most cases, but if you really need to stream data from your client to your server. I would really advise just using WebSockets or one of these uh, frameworks. And do you know if one of these frameworks that you mentioned supports service and defense uh, as one of their frameworks? Yeah, um, SoftJS uh, implements uh, service and defense um, as transport. Uh, the, the
the normal restriction for service and defense is that you can't use it in a cross domain fashion. So what they've done, they've hosted an iframe on the server, the client code creates an iframe, um, and use post message to send data to that iframe that's hosted on the server, which then again is sending data and receiving data. So it's hacky, it, it adds a lot of overhead, but it's definitely possible. But again, if you are using a, a, a browser that supports WebSockets, it will just upgrade to WebSockets instead of uh, service and events. Yeah. Do you have any statistics about uh, the transport? How many, what percentage do, uh, do uh, WebSockets? I do know the statistics for uh, the blockage of WebSockets. You should <laughs> consider 10% um, all your connections blocked. Okay. So it's, it's decent, but it, again, it depends on what type of application you're building. If you're building something for the enterprise, use 10% does matter, again, yeah, depends on your application. Any questions, yeah? yeah. Uh, how about, how about uh, WebRTC uh, data channels? Uh, is there, are there any plans to uh, support that? Or is there, uh, the the problem, problem with uh, WebRTC data channels is that it's from client to client, yeah. not from client to server. So in order to implement that, you basically <coughs> have to build a server which kind of looks like a client and send data in that way. Yeah. But nobody has been insane enough to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's def definitely uh, a good thing to check out in, uh, in the future because it doesn't uh, use TCP. It uses uh, yeah. STCP or something like that, um, which uh, runs on uh, UDP instead of TCP. So you will have less um, network congestion so it's definitely viable for the future if someone is insane enough to build it. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, I have one question. Um, you were talking about implementation of plugins and how it's, for example, compatible with frameworks like Angular. Yeah. And then you mentioned, but I don't use Angular, so I kind of have to ask, what's your content uh, JavaScript framework of choice? None. <laughs> I don't use any big frameworks to implement uh, from that. Okay. Most of these frameworks are usually deploaded um, for small applications that I'm building. And if you're using uh, really uh, front-end heavy uh, data, Angular might not even be the best uh, option for it. You might even want to use React because it's more capable of updating your DOM in uh, a faster fashion. So it really depends again on how much data you're sending to the framework that you're using. And that's it for me.